As we come in our study to the end times, we have those phrases. I just want to quickly go over them again. The last days and the last day. Sometimes it's called the latter times and the last time. And sometimes it's called the, end, the time of the end or the end times. Now these phrases have actually four different applications. The, the church age which began at the day of Pentecost, was the beginning of the end times for the church. It's the beginning of the end times for the church. It's, that's why it's called the end times or the last times, plural. The rap, what we call the rapture of the church, and by the way, the rapture is not a Bible word. Uh, the rapture of the church will be the end time or lat latter time, singular. That'll be the end of the church age and that will just be a day and we have a better name for it than rapture rapture is not in the bible but there is a bible name for it and it's called the day of christ we have the day of the lord that's the tribulation period but the day of christ is the rapture it's a day it's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye so for the church age the last times we're in the last times right now for uh, Israel, uh, and the, after the rapture, the tribulation period follows, that's the beginning of the last days for the Jews. That's the beginning of, of that. And I'm just going to digress for just a minute. In your lesson sheets today, we gave you a, um, some information here concerning Israel and the church. Israel and the church are two totally separate entities altogether. Totally, totally different. And on the first page, we have their calling. Israel is in the left-hand column. The church is in the right-hand column. Their calling is totally different. In fact, very much opposite. Then, and we, somehow or other, <laughs> that got printed again on the inside there. Just ignore that. Then under number two there, their conduct. The church and the Jews are to live differently. Here we have in the one column, the, the, the Israel. In the right-hand column, we have the church. Going to the next page, we have worship. The worship of, the, of Israel and the church is totally different worship. We have Israel, left column, church, right column. And, and so, so it's, they are two totally separate entities. And then the future. The future, Israel has a totally different future than the church does. Israel, the left-hand column, church, the right-hand column. So at your leisure, you can take these and, and study these and go over them, and you find they are total opposites in their calling, their future, their conduct, their worship. Total, total opposites altogether. This is what we call rightly dividing the word of truth, or I should say this is what the Holy Spirit calls Rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. So, anyways, getting back to our note sheets, we have the church age. That's total, that's totally separate from uh, Israel. Then we have the tribulation period, which will begin the last days for the Jews. The tribulation period is followed by the second coming and the millennium, and that will be the last day, singular, for Israel. That'll be the end of time itself. When the millennium ends, there will be no more time after that. And that's when Jesus returns and he sets up his kingdom. Now in the Bible, <clears throat> from the book of Genesis all the way through the Old Testament and on into the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then on even into the early chapters of the book of Acts, we have the end times refer to Israel and the Gentile world. The, the, the prophecies of the end time for the church are not in any of that. Not in the Old Testament, not in the Gospels, not in the early chapters of the book of Acts. It's all Israel and the Jews. 
Now the church is going to be raptured up to heaven, or as the Bible says, the day of Christ will take place, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and immediately the tribulation period will begin. And Israel will take center stage. The church will be gone, and Israel will be uh, at center stage there. Then that tribulation is going to be um, followed by the second coming. And guess what? Jerusalem, that disputed city, is going to be the capital of Israel and the capital of the world at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And a world government is going to be set up. And it's going to be a successful world government because King Jesus is going to be running it. And the Bible says he shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. It's going to be no hanky-panky fooling around stuff. He's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. It's going to be a law and order government, perfect government on the face of this earth. And then that will be followed by, the second coming will be followed by the millennium. That, that's the, uh, the earthly kingdom. And Israel will be the head nation. So the church and Israel, totally two separate entities altogether. Now in the latter part of the New Testament, if you, uh, the, the last epistles, and by the way, the epistles in the New Testament are not in chronological order, the order in which they were written. If you have a Schofield Bible, or some other study Bible perhaps, I have a Schofield Bible, and in the Schofield Bible it has the dates of, that each epistle was written. You look in the latter part of the New Testament uh, for the last days that refer to the church age, and you found there, we find that they're in the latter epistles. The, or the early epistles were 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, that were, they were written in 54 AD. Those, those are the first two epistles written. And then the book of Galatians was written in 58 AD. Then the book of 1st Corinthians was written in 59 AD, and 2nd Corinthians and Romans were written in 60 AD. Those were the early epistles. Then the, the ones that were written later are the ones that talk about the last days of the church. First Timothy was written in 65 AD. Second Timothy, 66 AD. Hebrews, 64 AD. Then we have James. James was the earliest one, it was written in 60 AD. And then first Peter, and that's a typo there, it should be 65 AD. 2 Peter, 66 A.D., 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, 90 A.D., and the book of Jude, 66 A.D. So these are, uh, these are the, the, the ones that talk about the end times or the last days concerning the, concerning the church. Now let's go to the, to the second page here. These latter epistles, they all lead into the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation is where... Uh, we have the culmination of all things. And if you'll notice there on your note sheets, the church age in the book of Revelation is chapter 2 and chapter 3. Let me show you something interesting about it. The word church or churches is in there 20 times in the book of Revelation. 19 of those 20 times are in the first three chapters. 19 of the 20 times. The last time is... It's way back in chapter 22 at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the book. Why are the word church and churches found 19 times in the first three chapters and then not again until the end chapter? Be simply because there is no church after that. The church is raptured up to heaven. Okay, then uh, after chapter 2 and 3, that's followed by chapter 4 and 5, which is the rapture. Now the key verse of the book of Revelation is Revelation 119. Revelation 119 says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The things that thou hast seen, that's chapter 1. The things which are, that's chapter 2 and 3, the church age. And then, the things that shall be hereafter. Well, the church is raptured at the end of chapter 3. Well, that's the end of the church age. Chapter 4 begins, here's the first verse. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Now, when you have a door open, it's for one of two reasons. To let someone in or to let someone out. In this case, it's to let someone in. That someone being the church. 
the door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. A talking trumpet. Well, who is this talking trumpet? Well, that's the trumpet that you have in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where it says that the, at the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which shall remain shall be uh, caught up with them, meet the Lord in the air. That's the trumpet in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it says that the, trump, the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. This is that trumpet. That trumpet sounds, and what happens? He's, the trumpet says, come up hither. That's the rapture. Come up. Raptured up. When does this happen? Very first verse of chapter 4 of Revelation. Chapter 2 and 3 was the church age. It ends right there. Then the rapture takes place. And then it says, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. The key verse says the things which thou hast seen, chapter 1, the things which are, chapter 2 and 3, and the things which shall be hereafter, chapters 4 through 22. So the bulk of the book of Revelation is still future. The hereafter starts with the rapture of the church. Then we have the, uh, that's followed by the, the tribulation period. The tribulation period, that's not for the church. The church is gone. It's up to heaven. This is where the Jews come in. This is Israel takes center stage on God's prophetic program now. And in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7, this is the time. It says, alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Whose trouble? Jacob. Who's Jacob? Israel. Remember, God changed his name. He was Jacob, which means surplanter. God changed his name to Israel, which means the prince of God. This is the time of Jacob's trouble here on earth. The church is gone at the end of chapter 3, start of chapter 4. The tribulation begins, chapter 6. And the time of Jacob's trouble began. Here's what Daniel said about that time. He said, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, that's Michael the archangel, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble. Whose trouble? Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Jacob's trouble. Be a time of trouble such as was never since there was a nation. Worst time in history. Here's what Jesus said about that same period. Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation. Not just tribulation, great tribulation. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Worse than the flood. Worse than Hitler's Holocaust. Worse than the Spanish Inquisition. Worse than any time. And it's all directed against, for the most part, directed against the Jews. And so the, um, uh, the tribulation period begins. Now, when, when, what's the first thing that's going to happen when the tribulation period begins? The very first thing, the Antichrist is going to be revealed. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. This is a counterfeit Christ. Jesus in chapter 19 rides a white horse. Here's a counterfeit Christ. He's on a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. Doesn't have any arrows, but he's got a bow. And a crown was given unto him. He's a king. And he went forth conquering, and to conquer, he's a conqueror. But he's a peaceful conqueror. He doesn't do it with bows and arrows. He has no arrows. So he, uh, the tribulation period, period begins with the revelation of the Antichrist. Now, if you turn with me in your Bibles to um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is uh, the, the revelation here of the, of the Antichrist. He goes forth conquering, but he's a peaceful conqueror. He has no arrows. He conquers by peace, which we will see uh, a little later. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting with the first verse, he says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. In other words, God says that the church should know the times and seasons. You need to be up on the signs of the times. You need to be up on the prophetic program of God. He says, I have no need 
to write unto you about the times and the seasons. Israel, on the other hand, has no knowledge of the times and seasons. You look up Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, where the disciples come to Jesus and they say, at this time you're going to set up your kingdom. And Jesus said unto them, ye have no need, or I'm sorry, I'm quoting the wrong verse here. He says, it is not for you to know the times or seasons. It is not for you to know the times or seasons. That was the chapter before the church begins. It is not for them to know the times or the seasons. For the church, it is for us to know. Shame on us if we don't know the times and the seasons in, in, which, we, in which we are living here. Well, reading on, it says, for, you, for yourselves know perfectly. Notice that perfectly. We're, we're supposed to be right up on it, to know it perfectly. That the day of the Lord, not the day of Christ, which is the rapture, but the day of the Lord, the tribulation and the millennium, the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. It's going to be unexpected. Verse 3, for when they, now notice it does not say we, or it does not say us. It says when they, who's, who are they? Well, these are the people that have missed the rapture and are living there when the tribulation begins. They shall say, peace and safety. Peace and safety. In other words, the we just read from, or saw up here on the screen, the, tr the Antichrist comes to power and he comes in peaceably. It says, when they shall say, peace and safety. There's something interesting about that word safety. It means security. Security. Like, are we security conscious today? Are we trusting government for our security? Looks like we've got health care, government health care. Sad day for America. Government health care, government pensions, everything government, big government, the expansion of government. When they shall say peace and safety or security, it says then sudden destruction cometh upon them, not us, but them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they, the world, shall not escape. They shall not escape. Okay, so here is the, here is, here is the picture here. The tribulation begins. The second coming takes place in chapter 19. Jesus comes back, the millennium, he sets up his kingdom, and then the new heavens and the new earth. Now what we're going to look at this morning is 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 18, the church age in the last days. We have some clues about the end time for Israel given to the church when we know that that time is, is getting close. Um, turn with me to another scripture, if you will, the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John chapter 3, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 5. Chapter 5 and, and verse 43. John 5, 43. Here's a warning that Jesus spoke. He says, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Jesus said, I've come to you, and you receive me not. What do we read in, in the first chapter of John? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. John 1.10. His own received him not. But he says there's going to be another. It's going to come in his own name. And him you're going to receive. That's the Antichrist. Okay? 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last time. He's writing this to the church. It is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, future shall come, even now, present tense, there are many antichrists. Oh, you get this? The last days of the church age, there's going to be many antichrists. Many types of the antichrists are going to be out there, all leading up to the one antichrist that will come upon the scene. We won't know who the Antichrist is because he does, he's not revealed to Revelation chapter 6. The church is raptured in Revelation chapter 4. So we won't be here. We don't know who he is. 
but there are many antichrists that will appear on the scene. They will be types of the antichrist, and whereby, it, the, the, the verse goes on and says, whereby we know that it is the last time. So the last days of the church age are going to be characterized by many antichrists. And um, uh, the, these many antichrists that are going to come on the scene, and we will find that history is full of antichrists. That is types of the antichrist. This is the fulfillment of 1 John 2.18 many antichrists that come upon the scene. As I said, we won't see them because we'll be gone. Uh, see, we won't see the antichrist because we'll be gone, but we will see the types of, of the antichrist. Now, we talked about this once before, but Barack Obama is not the antichrist. I know some of you think he is. He is not the antichrist, and there's, there's a number of reasons why people, people think that. But however, he is a type of the antichrist. But the false Christs that have, uh, false messiahs that have come upon the scene. Back in 176 BC, a man by the name of Antichus Epiphanes came on the scene. He was a terror. He had it in his mind that he was going to, he was in Syria, he had it in his mind he was going to go conquer Egypt, and the only way from Syria to Egypt is through the nation of Israel. And he marched through the nation of Israel on his way to Egypt when he was told by, uh, uh, by other uh, dictators uh, that were the, the Greek government broke up into four parts after Alexander the Great's death. Antiochus was, a, was ahead of part of it. He was warned, don't go into Egypt. He wanted to conquer Egypt, but he's warned, don't go into Egypt. So he decided discretion was the better part of valor, so he turned his army around, he came back through Israel. And he turned all his rage and venom on the Jews. They thought he was the Antichrist as prophesied in the book of Daniel. They thought he, was, he went in, he forbade uh, the Jews to worship Jehovah. He put a statue of himself in the temple, he defiled the temple. He offered a pig on the altar. In, in the temple in Jerusalem. He slaughtered Jews by the thousands. They really thought he was the Antichrist, but he wasn't, but he was a good type of the Antichrist. And then in the first century, near the end of the first century, the, the emperor of Rome, Nero, Nero comes on the scene, and what does he do? He, 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 he didn't discriminate. He killed Jews and Christians equally. He hated them both. Jews and Christians, he, he killed them. Many in the church back in the first century, they thought Nero is the Antichrist. Obviously, Nero was, was, not the, uh, was not the Antichrist. Well, is Barack Obama the Antichrist? No, not, not at all. His presidency has been marked by a s string of failures, and the Antichrist is going to be just the opposite. He's going to start out very successful. He's going to end up a failure, but he starts out he just dazzling the people with his brilliance and his success and so forth. Now there's some, there's some characteristics that carry over. For instance, Obama is a socialist. He makes no bones about that. He calls himself a progressive, but that's a, uh, that's a socialist. And the Antichrist is going to be a socialist. We've talked about this many times. He shall scatter among them the prey, the spoil, and the riches, Daniel 11, 24. He's going to redistribute the wealth. He's, he's going to be a socialist. But that part fits. But Daniel 11, 37 says that the Antichrist is going to be a Jew. Obama is not a Jew, so he couldn't be the Antichrist. It says in Daniel 11, 37, neither shall he regard the God of his father. So yeah, he, he, he would not fit into the mold of the Antichrist. Now, in my lifetime, I have seen many types of the Antichrist. Most of them were in the uh, early years of my life. In fact, the first four of them took place in the 1930s and 1940s. And if you are old enough to remember or you're keyed into history, you will know that, that there were many that came on the scene back then that thousands of Christians believed were going to be the Antichrist, but none of them could have possibly been the Antichrist. Adolf Hitler was the best type of the Antichrist. He murdered Jews, six million of them. Jesus said, when the Antichrist comes, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. 
Judea? Yeah, Judea, because that's where Jews live, in Judea. And he said, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither in the, on the Sabbath day. Didn't say Sunday. He said the Sabbath day. The church worships on Sunday, but the Jews worship on the Sabbath day, Saturday. So um, uh, Hitler, Hitler uh, he had a lot of the characteristics of the Antichrist, but he obviously was not the Antichrist. Now he, he killed Jews. He was a conqueror. Revelation 6.2 says that the Antichrist is going to be a conqueror, but he's going to be a peaceful conqueror. Hitler was not a peaceful conqueror. His army swept across Europe and captured Europe very quickly. And then there are people who believe that he was the Antichrist because of his name and because of a mark. The name, they said, proves him to be the Antichrist. What was his name? Fuhrer, six letters. Adolf, six letters. Hitler, six letters. Six, six, six. Ha, see, there's proof. He's the Antichrist. No, he wasn't the Antichrist. Sorry. What about his mark? The Antichrist is going to put a mark on everybody. The swastika. Is that the mark? No, Hitler was not the Antichrist. He was a type of the Antichrist. A lot of things fit that he could have been the Antichrist, but there was also a lot of things that did not fit. He had a satanic connection. Uh, there, there is a book uh, on the market. Erwin uh, uh, Lutzer wrote it a number of years ago about Hitler and his... Uh, his satanic connection. He was deep into the occult. He was, I don't know if he was, could actually be called a Satan worshiper, but, but he was deep into, into, uh, into that stuff. Also, Hitler was a European. The Antichrist is going to come out of Western Europe. But Hitler was not a Jew, although there is some speculation about his ancestry, that his real name was Schickelgruber instead of Hitler. And uh, he may have been a Jew, but he wouldn't admit to it. And he certainly didn't live that way because he murdered as many Jews as he, as he possibly can. But Hitler could not have been the Antichrist. Well, we know now he wasn't. But if you were living at that time, he could not have been the Antichrist because those that were promoting him as the Antichrist overlooked a very important thing. Israel was not back in their homeland. How could he be the Antichrist if Israel was not back in, in their uh, homeland? Um, and not only does this eliminate Hitler, but it also eliminates a couple other candidates of that time, Mussolini and, and, and Roosevelt. Now, you see, in each case, some things fit that make them a type of the Antichrist, but then there's other things that don't, can't possibly fit. And we had another type of the Antichrist was Stalin. He was back from that same era. He was a type of the Antichrist. First off, he was an atheist. I think the Antichrist probably is too. Daniel 11.37 says he shall not regard the God of his fathers. And Stalin was a mass murderer. He deliberately killed 40 million of his own people. 40 million of his own people. He starved them to death sent them out into some open fields of Siberia, the dead of winter, put barbed wire around them and let them freeze to death because th th that they, uh, they opposed him. And uh, uh, he was a communist dictator. But you know, communism or socialism or Marxism, whatever you want to call it, is never a mass movement of the people. It's always imposed upon people from the top down. Nobody ever voted in a communist government. It, it's always imposed from the top down. That's why it says about the uh, Antichrist in the book of Daniel, he shall become strong with the small people. It's going to be a, a small group, a conspiracy that, uh, that uh, surges him in, in, into power. Well, Stalin was a dictator, and he killed a lot of Jews. He, he, he did all that. We'll, we'll grant him that. But for the most part of his life, Israel was not back in their homeland. So he couldn't have been the Antichrist. And then we had an excellent type back in that same era, Benito Mussolini. He was a dictator. At the beginning of his life, he was a socialist. So was the Antichrist in Daniel 11:24. But then he decided socialism was no good and he became a fascist. So that part uh, falls away. He was a conqueror, and the big thing about Mussolini is 
He was a dictator of Italy and he ruled from the city of Rome. The Antichrist is going to rule from Rome, the revived Roman Empire. However, the same thing is true about Mussolini as the others. He couldn't have been the Antichrist, although people thought he was, because the Jews were not back in their homeland. And then we had another candidate, which was a, a surprise. I remember these days when people were saying that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the Antichrist. And they used to drag out all their ammunition to prove it. Yeah, Daniel 7.25 says that he shall think to change times and seasons. Hey, see, there's proof. Roosevelt changed Thanksgiving. He said it was too close to Christmas, so he put it back a week later. There he is. There's the Antichrist. He's changing times and seasons. People believe that. And what about the mark? Well, yeah, we got the mark. The Blue Eagle, the NRA, National Recovery Act. The Blue Eagle. Every place you went, the stores, there was a Blue Eagle. Uh, if you ever, uh, remember the TV program, The Waltons? Uh, they, you, you would go in the, into the little general store there, and they always had the, on the door or on the wall, they had the Blue Eagle, NRA, under it, you know. That was in all the stores back in the 30s. National Recovery Act. Yeah, Christian said, that's the, that's the mark of the beast. Must be him. And he was hailed as a savior. He came in to get us out of the Depression. Guess what? He never did. He didn't end the Depression. World War II ended the Depression. There was as many unemployed when World War II broke out as, as there was when he came to, to, uh, to power. And he was the only president ever elected four times. Had great popularity. Another interesting thing about him is he died of a head hemorrhage. I was a little, little guy, I think 12 years old, 13 at that time. And I was a Detroit news carrier. And I remember we got a phone call in the middle of the night. Come down to the paper station. We got a, you got to pedal an extra. And the extra said, Roosevelt is dead. He died of a head hemorrhage. Well, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13 that the Antichrist is going to be, uh, ha receive a deadly wound to his head. And it will be healed. And so a lot of people said, see, there he is, the Antichrist. He's going to come back to life again. Never did. Christians are all excited about these so-called Antichrists. We seem to be, the church seems to be more interested in the Antichrist than the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the one we're to be looking for. He's coming back too. And we need to be looking for him. And he's going to be, be here to take us out long before the Antichrist, or not long before, but before the Antichrist uh, uh, comes upon the scene. Well, here again, the Jews were not in the land when Roosevelt, when Roosevelt was, the, uh, was the president. So he could not have been the Antichrist. And I'd like to take you back almost 40 years now. Those of you that are old enough to remember this, remember the 1970s. A good many of you remember it. Some of you are too young. I want to tell you about the 1970s. Ugly clothes. <laughs> Not, yeah, ugly clothes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and ugly music. <laughs> All right. Um, in the 1970s, Henry Kissinger <laughs> came on the scene. Folks, I think about half of Bible-believing Christians were convinced that Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist. And it, it, it was absolutely unbelievable. There was even books written about it. He's the Antichrist. There was all these innuendos. Yes, he's the Antichrist. He must be the one. They were thoroughly convinced that he was the Antichrist. Now, I... I got so intrigued by this that I decided I'm going to keep a file on Henry Kissinger, okay? And I saved a bunch of things. And I knew he wasn't the Antichrist. I knew he wasn't the Antichrist for a number of different reasons. One was that there was no temple built in Jerusalem, and the Antichrist is going to go into that temple. And uh, another reason that he, is not the, he was not the head of state of any country, and the Antichrist is, and, and other reasons as well. But I clipped all these out of newspapers. Here's the Detroit News of September 20th, 1974. The new openings to the communist world, the Vietnamese peace settlement, the Nobel Peace Prize, the ceasefire in the Middle East, all these were the achievement of the wizard, 
Henry Kissinger. Here's from U.S. News and World Report of uh, April, sec uh, April 22nd, 1974. It's, it calls him, it says, Kissinger is functioning as an American president for international relationships. He is a giant in international affairs. He is a real wizard. His genius has enabled the president to change the entire course of world politics and economics. He has accomplished almost impossible compromises through, uh, through his brain's frankness and persistence. Boy, a, a, a miracle worker. Here's the free press from June 11th, 1974. The well-deserved accolades for our incomparable Secretary of State have stopped just short of asserting that he can walk on water. Kissinger has done a miracle. The world may well be in the midst of the age of Kissinger, America's new prophet of peace. Christians were gobbling this stuff up. Here's one from the Boston Sunday Advertiser from May 14, 1972. This is Henry Kissinger's father. He says, Henry's idea are to bring about a new world order. Then we read from the Detroit News, August the 4th, 1975. President Gerald Ford visited over in Romania and uh, he was invited to a Romanian Orthodox service. Kissinger was with him and he invited Kissinger to come and here's what Kissinger replied. He says, I am beyond salvation. Here's a pre free press from February 18, 1973. This is his parents. His mother said, my son, the Prince of Peace. Here's the Lexington Herald of June 24th of that year. Actress Carol Channing met Kissinger. She said, uh, um, I used to think that he can't really be all that devastating, but now that I've met him, I am dazzled. He dazzled people. Here's the free press from July 17th of 1974. Of all places, the Miss Universe contest. And it says the beauties of uh, vote for Kissinger. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger is regarded by the beauties assembled in Manila for the Miss Universe contest as the greatest person in the world today. And no one else came close in the vote. Big deal. <laughs> Probably a bunch of airheads, but anyways. <laughs> Here's from the news, November 15, 1973. Presumably, Dr. Henry Kissinger launched some kind of trial balloon when he said in a Peking interview that the United States is looking carefully into the possibility of writing a mutual security treatment treaty with Israel. Hey, that's Daniel 927, the covenant. He's going to establish a covenant. Here is the free press of May 6, 1974. He comes on stage as the answer to everybody's prayer. Uh, President of Egypt, Mr. Sadat, said Dr. Kissinger, he praised him to the skies and called him a miracle man. And Prime Minister Golda Meir of Israel, she says, let's see what the magician has to bring as he was on his way to Israel. The Free Press of April 29, 1974, headlines, Egypt expecting a Kissinger miracle. Uh, President Anwar Sadat of Egypt says he believes Henry Kissinger is a man of miracles. And several times during the one hour interview, Sadat referred to Kissinger as my friend Henry, Henry, a worker of miracles. Here's the last one, the Free Press from May 30th, 1974. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger has pulled a new miracle um, peace agreement, I'm sorry, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger has pulled a new Middle East peace agreement out of his magician's hat. Christians were eating this up. They said he's got to be the Antichrist. He's not the Antichrist. We're still here. The church is still here. We're not going to be here when he comes on the scene. And he's just one of many of the types of the Antichrist. First John 8, 2, 18. Antichrist shall come, but there shall be many antichrists preceding him. 
when we see many antichrists, we know that we're in the last of the last days of the church age. Go back to the time of Napoleon, and Napoleon was a type of the Antichrist. He came from Western Europe. He was a conqueror. At first he was good to the Jews. Then later he turned on the Jews. But the thing about Napoleon that got people excited, he tried to establish the Holy Roman Empire, which they took to be the revival of the Roman Empire, which is going to take place in the last days, which we believe very well could be the uh, European Union. But Napoleon, like all the others, was not the Antichrist. So history is full of many, many antichrists. He is going to come and by peace he shall destroy many. Daniel, oh, that's Daniel 8, 25. Daniel eleven twenty one. 21, he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom through flatteries. Daniel eleven twenty four. 24, he shall enter peaceably upon the fattest places of the province. So he's going to come in as a peaceful conqueror. Remember what it said in 1 Thessalonians? When they shall say, peace and safety, then cometh sudden destruction upon them. Not us, them, the world. And Daniel 9, 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, that's Israel, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease and, and, and so forth. So he, he's going to sign this peace treaty with Israel. And so um, uh, we, we remember the words of the Lord Jesus. He said that there shall arise false Christs and false prophets. And we have seen many false Christs, false prophets that have come within the lifetime of many of us here. It's a sign of the, the sign here of, of the end days. So history is full of many of these antichrists. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11 that if there cometh, if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom, ye, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might bell, well bear with him. He warns about another Jesus another spirit, and another gospel. Well, the church has been filled, uh, the church age, I should say, has been filled with many antichrists, and the real one cannot be revealed until the rapture of the church takes place. Now, we have a type in the Old Testament. Then we're going to give you some verses from the New Testament. But here's an Old Testament type, and that Old Testament type is Lot. You know, this guy Lot, he's a He's a puzzle. He was a believer. We find out reading that in uh, Peter's epistles that Lot was a believer. He was called a righteous man, but you would never know it by his lifestyle. And he lived in the wicked city of Sodom. And in Genesis 19, verse 22, God sends an angel, two angels actually, to deliver Lot out of Sodom. And here's, here's what the scripture says. The angel says, haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. And then in the 24th verse, the Lord reigned upon Sodom and, uh, and Gomorrah, brimstone on fire. Well, that's a type of the tribulation period. But the angel tells Lot, I can't do anything until you leave Sodom. God is not going to do anything until the church leaves the earth. And I think Lot is a good type of the church. He was a carnal believer. He's a good type of the church. But even a carnal believer, God says, until, until you're out of the city, I can't do, I can't do anything uh, to, to that city. Well, many New Testament verses bear this out. Revelation 3.10, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, that's the tribulation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. He says, I'm going to keep the church from that. That's written to the church at Philadelphia. And then in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from what? The wrath to come. Wrath to come? That's the tribulation period. That's the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 5.9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, the tribulation period, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5.9, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. God's not going to leave his church here any more than he left Lot back there in, um, in, in Sodom there. And so uh, the real Antichrist is not going to be revealed until the church has been raptured. We will be 
long gone at that time. Revelation 15, 1, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. This is during the tribulation period. Notice, the wrath of God. And then we read in chapter 16, verse 1, Pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. That's the tribulation period. And then in Revelation chapter 6, they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So the tribulation period is called the wrath of God. God says, I've not appointed you to wrath, but to obtain salvation. We'll be saved before that wrath, day of wrath takes place. Notice there, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, which means apostasy, and that man of sin, that's the Antichrist, be revealed the son of perdition. First thing that happens with the tribulation, the revelation of the Antichrist, that's Revelation 6-2, the rider on the white horse, it says as soon as this apostasy sets in, then the man of sin will be revealed Verse 6 of that same chapter, And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. His time being the tribulation period. So we're not going to see him. So don't worry about him. Don't worry or this one is the Antichrist or that one is the Antichrist. There are others out there that have been tagged as a possible Antichrist. The guy from the European Union, uh, uh, Selena, Salona or something like that his name is. I heard some Christians get up and say, how that Prince Charles of Great Britain was the Antichrist. I don't know where they got that from. Uh, I've heard this one and that one. I heard Juan, King Juan Carlos of Spain is going to be the Antichrist. On and on and on it goes. Well, these are all types. And they're, that's all they are is types. And we won't be here to see, to see the real one when, when he comes on the scene. In Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, we're told that in these last days God has spoken unto us by his Son. How does he speak to us by his son? In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew presents him as our king. Mark presents him as a servant. Luke presents him as the son of man. And John presents him in his deity as the son of God. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have his works. In the Gospel of John, we have his words. Or you can say we have his deeds and his discourses. So don't let hysterical, emotional people cause hysteria in, in you or in the church. The Antichrist cannot be revealed until we are gone. But it must be close because many Antichrists are on the scene. So it tells us how deep we are into the last days. And we're going to, next week, which will be the last Sunday in the auditorium here. Um, next week, we'll begin the first part of the last days by studying the church. In the, actually, today was the first part of the, the church in the last days, but we're going to be picking it up next week. Okay, let's look to God in prayer. We'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, dismiss us now with your blessing. May we leave this place rejoicing, Lord, because we know when that day of your wrath comes, We'll be in heaven with you around the throne of God, praising you and worshiping you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all you've done for us. Dismiss us with your blessing. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.